So you're going to have three of us speak to you today. We've dragged um, Katerina out of the clinic because she needs to go back and save lives in the clinics after she's given her talk and so we'll field her questions for her and then Barabi and myself. So uh, it's my turn to uh, start off. So just so we all um, are on the same page again, I know many of you come every year, so I'm just giving you a refresher course here and many of you actually see me as well um, to look after your eyes. So we'll just uh, recap for everybody in the audience. So on uh, your left is what the retina looks like in a normal healthy uh, eye with uh, the retina and blood vessels and optic nerve there. The one on the right, uh, and for those who can't see, I'll describe it as a retina that has lots of debris building up in the back. It's fatty deposits called drusen. Drusen is a German word for yellow deposit. Uh, and so they are little uh, age-related uh, debris that's accumulating in your retina. And uh, for all intents and purposes, that actually uh, affects the health of the cells in the retina and ultimately can lead to loss of vision. We call this early age-related macular degeneration because it hasn't resulted in loss of vision as yet. It's like a risk factor for losing vision. The best way to think of this is early disease. It is a disease, um, but it hasn't caused problems. So it's like having blood pressure that gives you a risk of a heart attack or a stroke, but as yet it hasn't caused you that problem. So it's called early, and if it's slightly more than just a few, it's called intermediate AMD. Some people call this dry because it's not wet, but if we can all get the world talking the same language, that would be helpful, and this is part of what we'd like to do today. This is actually early disease. Nothing has happened to your vision to this point. And then what happens is in some people, not in everybody, about one in seven people will progress to either what's called dry or wet AMD. So dry is the one that's on your left. It is actually where the cells die. So they're moth-eaten holes, as you can see, a big white spot in the middle. So there's a big moth-eaten hole in the middle. It starts small, starts multiple little ones, and then they join up. And that's the dry macular generation. And the wet macular generation is where there's bleeding in the back of the eye. So actually, the natural progression from early is to go to dry, but in some people, there's this extra stimulus to try and help the situation by causing blood vessels. But they actually are the wrong blood vessels and they leak. It would sound like a good idea to get some more oxygen and nutrients, but in fact, they're faulty blood vessels and they leak. And that's what causes the problem. And in the olden days, this used to be the end result was a big scar right in the middle of your central vision, interfering with reading, driving and recognising faces as the main issues. As you can see, it doesn't affect the peripheral retina and so like glaucoma, it uh, allows you to still see to walk around and get around. It's just that central vision which is at risk. Now, in the past, we've given talks on wet AMD because that was by far the most dramatic part of this disease. It could happen overnight. You could lose your vision suddenly and people would present to casualty at major hospitals like the Iron Ear. But for the last 10 years, we have been involved in trials and now as routine standard care of injecting a drug into the eye, which has uh, profoundly changed the outcome for many people with this disease, not everybody, but with many people. In fact, we've much more than halved the rate of blindness from this disease. So in the last 10 years, that's been a staggeringly good result. Unfortunately, the treatments are ongoing often and often quite frequent. But we're not aiming to talk any more about this wet AMD today because that's been the subject of things in the past and most of the trials now are just trying to perfect uh, a slightly better drug or a slightly longer mode of action. Um, so we're going to leave wet macular degeneration and we're going to move on to the other one of the late forms which is the dry macular degeneration. So that's where there's these moth-eaten holes and for which at the moment there is no treatment apart from a good lifestyle um, and eating well and looking after yourself, we don't actually have a specific treatment for that disease. And I'm going to introduce Katerina, who's our fellow this year, and she's going to tell you about the current trials uh, and what's happening in this space in terms of uh, dry AMD. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thanks uh, for coming. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Katarina Kreis. I'm one of the research fellow with CIRA this year. And this doesn't work. It does. Uh, 
so as Robin uh, already described, there are two forms of late stage macular degeneration. One of them is wet and one of them is dry. So I will be talking about current clinical trials in uh, uh, geographic atrophy, which is the dry late macular degeneration. Here is a scientific description of geographic atrophy, but what does it actually mean? The geographic atrophy, as Robin mentioned, is, is as it appears to us when we examine the patient, just mothy spots on the back of the eye, which result from the death of the cells of the so-called retinal pigment epithelium, which is a layer under the retina which nourishes the nerve cells in the retina and also takes away the byproducts of the metabolism. So your nerve cells produce debris and let's say rubbish and the RPE, the retinal pigment epithelium, have, helps to remove it from the retina. If these cells die, this function of uh, cleaning up and nourishment at the same time disappears. So in the upper line, oh, oh, sorry, here we have for recap a wet macular degeneration. So this is a patient with significant bleed in the back of the eye and that's how it looks in a cross section of the eye. But this is the dry macular degeneration. This is the one I'm going to talk about today. So when we look in the back of the eye, we cannot really see much happening there. We cannot see any blood. But in one of the kind of images we are using in the cross section, we can see that there is a lot of scarring and you can see there is this very well surrounded lesion in the center of the of the eye. To be able for us to determine the size of the lesion and with the current clinical trials for geographic atrophy, we need to have the state of the art imaging techniques. We are using multiple, about four types of pictures we take of the back of the eye and all of them put together gives us the idea how big the lesions are. Sometimes we cannot see them just looking inside your eyes. That's why we need to have multiple pictures and put them together. As a part of the clinical trials, it is required from us to have all these techniques. So the clinical trials then can see, we can see in the clinical trial how well the patient is responding or not responding to the treatment. So these are three examples of the multimodal imaging we are using. Um, oh. This is just a color fundus photograph, and you can see um, that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll try. Um, uh, we can see these yellowish areas, which Robin described as moth eaten areas in the back of the eye. And there is a lot of drusen around. Now, in the next picture, which is called fundus autofluorescence, the areas are dark. And on the color photographs, we cannot see all of the patches, which then are clearly visible in the autofluorescence. I apologize. Um, this is another picture of a patient with geographic atrophy and a fluorescent angiogram, which is a dye going through the vessels of the patient. And we take a lot of photographs of the back of the eye and the scar actually highlights during that test. Robin was mentioning that the geographic atrophy starts as small patches, which then join together. They usually start outside the center of the vision and slowly, slowly the disease progresses. The areas get larger and then get together and cause um, deterioration of vision. 
part of the study's assessment is to map out how big these areas are and the new um, imaging techniques, techniques allow us to circumscribe, to make lines around the lesions and calculate, put all the lesions together and calculate how big the area of the geographic atrophy is. And this is so-called endpoint of many of the current trials for geographic atrophy. So we are looking at how big the lesions are, whether our current trials do help to slow down the enlargement of this lesion, so slow down the growing of the lesions. At CIRA, currently we have three trials we are enrolling patients for, which are focused on late stage geographic AMD, so in the geographic atrophy. Um, the first one, the natural history, is not a treatment trial. It's a trial where we enroll patients and just watch how slowly or fast they progress without any treatment. We basically just take bloods and send them for genetic testing because we believe that there is a connection between genetics and AMD. The second dot point um, are two clinical trials where we inject a treatment inside the eye. And both of these medications are trying to slow down inflammation process in the retina, which again is um, part of a progress of uh, age-related macular degeneration. So basically, we are trying to slow down the inflammation and this way slow down the progression of geographic atrophy. The last dot point, um, I wrote here non-medication. It's a medication which is currently used for treatment of glaucoma, and it has been established that this medication can protect the nerve cells of the back of the eye, which are helping us to see. Here are a few photographs, again, of the multimodal imaging. So here we have a color fundus photograph of the left eye. This is the same patient on the um, autofluorescence image, so not much visible on the, uh, on the color photo, and the lesion in the color photo looks much smaller than actually on the autofluorescence. Here again is the flora angiogram, so the color dye going through the vessels, and um, uh, we can see in the very early stages uh, the vessels of the underlying uh, the vessels underlying the retina, and this is so called SDOCT, so um, computer tomogram, um, which shows loss of loss of the uh, retinal pigment epithelium in the back of the eye. So there is a lot of scarring and uh, the nourish, nourishing cells, the layer of the nourishing cells is uh, unfortunately missing. Um, another exciting treatment, which is uh, not trialed at CIRA, but is done overseas, is the stem cell treatment. There are three types of stem cells, um, which are collected from different parts of human body and from human embryos. And currently, um, again, this is, this is just a scientific explanation. So what is the point of the stem cells, what we are trying to do? The stem cells are able to um, make themselves to the tissue we actually would like to have. So we are, not we, but the scientists uh, overseas are trying to make from stem cells, cells of the retinal pigment epithelium. There have been uh, clinical studies already done in the United States where they implanted the new created 
pigment epithelium cells in the back of the eye under the retina, and they are hoping that these cells will integrate with the patient's retina and help to nourish and um, maintain the good function of the existing retina. Unfortunately, these results um, are not yet at the level that we can expect uh, this treatment to be widely used because the cells which are implanted unfortunately die after a while. So the treatment basically works only for a short period of time. What we are doing at Sierra though, we are trying to, from skin samples, uh, part of the stem cells can be done from skin, patient skin. Uh, so we are trying to make cultures from these skin um, cells and basically try to study how the cells do behave, but we are not actually implanting anything in the eyes. Though, so this is all done in small ampules, so no patient, um, live patient involved, just for the skin samples. Okay, so that's all for me. Thank you. We'll have a chance for questions uh, at the end, but Katerina, please go back to the clinic and we'll um, field your questions for you. So I think just the take home message from Katerina was that the ability to now image the back of the eye has enabled us to st tackle geographic atrophy. So, uh, with wet AMD, it was very easy. It bled, you lost your vision. We you know, gave some injections, the vision improved. It was a much easier problem to study with geographic atrophy because, as Katerina said, the little holes don't start in the middle. It's hard to see when you look in. It was hard to imagine what a trial would look like, how you would work out whether those drugs were working because you can imagine it actually takes years before those people actually lose function to read the chart. So the, the developments with the imaging has enabled us to have another look at that part of the disease. And that's one reason why we haven't been able to do trials is not because of a lack of drugs that might work. It's more how, how are you going to plan a trial where you couldn't see or measure anything. So now all those beautiful images that were there on the screen enabled us to really uh, measure very precisely how big the thing is and you can measure how fast it grows over a year. So the trials that Katerina described are actually measuring the speed of growth and trying to see whether we can slow that down. To get into those trials, you have to have reasonable size spots because you have to be able to measure them uh, reliably. So not everybody with a little bit of geographic atrophy could come into those trials. They were quite specific. They wanted just enough and not too much, not too close to the middle so that they could measure if it grew into the middle. And they wanted to concentrate on people that had characteristics that we think uh, predicted a, a, a higher rate of growth because you really want to get an answer. You don't want people whose little holes are going to stay there for forever. So that's why if anyone had been involved in trying to get into those studies, not everyone was going to be eligible, which is why there was that natural history arm, which if you w couldn't get into a trial of treatment, you could be on the books and be being followed so that we could learn a bit more about how people change over time. So that explains those studies. But of course, like you, we would like to prevent people getting there in the first place. So why can't we do something with the people with the early disease, the drusen? Why can't we stop them going towards the wet or the dry? And really that's been the um, sole focus uh, of our, uh, our own research for the past uh, over a decade. And so Barabi will come and tell you what our one of our studies is to try. And now that we have all that imaging that we can image the back of the eye and understand what's happening better, how can we start to address preventing people from going forward? And people may have heard uh, from Liz last year and Byerby is going to update you on our lead study. And the idea is to stop you going from that early disease to that late disease. So Byerby. Um. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Bairavi, and I'm one of the uh, clinical trial orthoptists um, working on the LEAD clinical trial, um, also known short for laser intervention in early age-related macular degeneration. And today I'll provide a brief introduction about um, age-related macular degeneration 
and a quick update um, on our laser trial. So age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, uh, is a leading cause of vision loss in Australia, um, affecting people uh, aged 50 years and older. I'm reiterating what um, both Robert and uh, Katerina uh, talked about earlier, um, AMD can be classified into two stages, um, early AMD and late AMD. Um, in the early stage of AMD, uh, usually drusen is present. Uh, drusen are the yellow deposits um, under the retina. Um, at this early stage of AMD, um, the vision is still, still good and the diagnosis is usually picked up um, on routine visit to the optometrist. With the uh, late AMD, it can be further divided into two types, uh, dry and wet AMD. Um, in the dry form, severe thinning of the macular region is responsible for the vision loss. Those um, affected by the wet form develop abnormal blood vessels and um, bleeding at the back of the eye, as seen in the picture here. Um, now, in terms of treatment options for uh, late age-related macular degeneration, currently the widely used treatment for wet AMD uh, is intravitreal anti-VEGF injections, which target the leaky blood vessels at the back of the eye. Um, although we have trials currently running for dry AMD, none are currently um, available for commercial use. Um, due to the relative slow progression of age-related macular degeneration from the early stage to the late stage, there is a time window of opportunity for intervention. And therefore, the um, pilot study was conducted. Um, so the world first pilot study of the LX nanosecond laser uh, ran for three years and had a total of 50 participants who all had treatment with the 2RT nanosecond laser in one eye. Um, now, this pilot study showed promising results um, where the participants showed improvement in macular function as well as a reduction um, of drusen, so the yellow deposits I talked about earlier. So this leads us to our current lead trial. Um, so the main aim of our uh, clinical trial is to determine whether the 2RT nanosecond laser can slow or partially reverse the progression of the disease before any late changes um, develop. Um, so what is the uh, 2RT nanosecond laser? So it's a nanosecond pulse laser. Uh, it uses very low energy levels to target the pigmented cells within the retina that may have been affected by AMD. Um, this causes a change in the pigmented cells, causing the he healthy cells to divide and bridge over the gap the laser has left. Um, new cells will function to clear away the debris or the drusen um, without leaving any burns. Um, this is also a, a gentle and um, painless laser, making it a more comfortable process for the patient. So the LEAD trial is a um, world's first multi-centred randomised control trial of nanosecond laser in the treatment of early AMD. Um, it is a double masked clinical trial, meaning that both the patient and assessor are both masked from knowing whether they had the 2RT or the sham laser. Um, all patients are seen um, every six months for a total duration of uh, three years. At each of these visits, they have a full comprehensive eye exam, so vision testing, multimodal imaging, like colour fundus photos, OCT scans to look at all the different layers of the retina, uh, macular function testing using the Mayer device, and um, a retinal exa exam performed by an eye doctor at the end of each visit to see if there's been any changes. Um, we have a total of 292 participants currently enrolled in our uh, laser study. And out of the 292, 162 are enrolled at the Centre for Eye Research here in East Melbourne, um, 50 at the Lions Eye Institute in Western Australia, 33 at Marsden Eye Research, 20 at Harriet Eye Care, 
um, in Melbourne, 17 at Adelaide Eye and Retina, Retinal Centre and 10 at the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust in Northern Ireland. Um, so just before I end my talk, a quick update on where we're at uh, with our clinical trial. Um, we finished recruitment uh, in March of 2015. Um, approximately 350 participants, uh, uh, people were screened at the Centre for Eye Research alone. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have a total number of 292 participants across, across all six sites. Um, some participants have already completed the study and we're expecting to uh, complete uh, the study in April of 2018. So that brings us to the end of my talk. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. And um, if you have any questions regarding the laser trial or anything else I talked about, uh, please feel free to ask during question time at the end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Barabi. So um, the trial is very important because uh, some of you may be aware that you can actually uh, buy this laser and you can set up shop and you can start using it today, uh, which is happening not only in Australia and around the world. Um, so much easier to get a device and use it rather than get a, a drug passed into practice. So we are, in fact, the only ones doing this randomised trial to determine whether or not this laser actually is useful and safe. So just if you or, or your friends or colleagues uh, hear about the ability to use this laser, it's actually not proven yet to be of any value, uh, and it's really only trials like this that will tell us, one, who should be treated, two, is it safe, and three, does it actually do anything that's useful? So don't um, be uh, swayed by what you read in newspapers at the moment as to the fact that there may be a laser that cures AMD. So uh, this brings me just to, to finish up with what I was wanting to say. So. If you followed the progression of our talks, you can see that someone with wet macular degeneration usually presents very acutely to a hospital or to a clinician with a major problem, thus easy to find for trials. For the dry macular degeneration where it's a slow change and for even earlier where there's no change, it's really hard for us at the Ioneer Hospital to find patients to take part in these world first studies of a disease which supposedly one in seven of us have over 50. So why is it that it takes us a year or so to, to find the handful of people that we need in all of these trials? And the problem is um, actually it's the ophthalmologists who don't see these people. It's the optometrists or general ophthalmologists perhaps that have these patients. And not only that, we don't have this uh, consistent uh, electronic medical record where you could go and ask everyone where are the last 10 patients with geographic atrophy that might be suitable, we could ring up and get them in. So in the olden days, this is Melinda and I where we could recruit very easily from the clinic for the wet AMD studies, but people don't come and sit on the clinic chair for these other forms of AMD. So to that end, you can go to the newspaper and say we have a new trial and what tends to happen is it gets um, uh, often a lot of good press but it ends up being that uh, people don't quite understand what we're looking for and an awful lot of people come and uh, want to be involved and they don't have the quite, quite the right part of the disease. So we've been working with optometry to try and educate them on how to read all those beautiful images that we just showed you, which remembering are quite new and people aren't used to understanding or no, don't know what, how to read those signs, yet they all have the pieces of equipment in their offices. So part of what we have to do is talk with optometry to teach them the sort of patients that need to come in for those trials. And if we're very unfortunate, we end up on the front page claiming that we have, you know, cured uh, this problem which we never did and never wanted to be on the front page. And as a result, it took us six months to handle all the calls that we got for the laser study because most people, as you can uh, understand, thought that we had cured AMD and that people with uh, poor vision from the end stage of late AMD, you know, were hoping that we could bring back vision. So it's actually not uh, useful for us to end up on the front page of the Herald Sun because it actually doesn't get us the people that we want for our trials. 
So what we have done uh, on the CIRA website has have created this button that if anyone is interested to enrol in a trial that, and they just want to register their name, they can go to the front page of the CIRA website and click this button that says register here for clinical trials. And we've called this registry uh, button website, S-I-G-H-T, which is a play on words website, which I thought was quite cute. Um, so you can go on there with no matter what disease you have, or even if you're a normal controller spouse, you can say, this is me, this is my address, and I'm happy to, to be called up if you need me. If you have AMD, you'll actually get a, a, a response email that says, terrific, you've got AMD, we're now recruiting for AMD, tell us a bit more about what you've got. And not only that, go away and find out who your optometrist or ophthalmologist is and come back and fill that in for us. So we're actually getting you all to do the work for us rather than us having to do the work. And I like to think of it as crowdsourcing patients for, for research. So if there's a trial happening, then, then there will be this uh, email uh, conversation with what can you find out about, about uh, what you've got. Would you like to come into one of our clinics where we could properly assess what you have? And then we'll have you on a registry for the next time a study comes up. You'll be, we'll know what you've got. We can call the right people rather than the wrong people. So that's a new initiative which we started in January and has actually been very successful in getting people to register and for us to have that conversation with those that appear to have the right sort of AMD for us to enrol in trials. And when I said we needed to educate not only ophthalmologists but optometrists, we've now started these uh, clinics that I call TRIC clinics, treatment ready, research ready eye clinics. So if you uh, are referred in by your optometrist or you register and you say you want to come to one of these studies, the hope is that we can run a bulk billing clinic where we have optometry students learning about macular degeneration, learning what all those images mean. We can get people fully characterised and take their blood so their genes are known. They're all waiting there exactly as the term says. They're ready for either research or treatment when they come about because part of the problem with clinical trials is it takes so long to recruit patients for studies and it's what's called competitive so everyone over in America is competing for a space that if we had had you on our list you could come in and there would there be more people in Australia being involved in these studies. So this is to get ourselves positioned for whatever's coming next because of course there will now be more studies for geographic atrophy, there will start to be more studies than our own on the early stage of the disease and we want to be well placed so that we can pounce on any of these studies with our patients that we know will suit the studies to get into. So that's two new initiatives that we've done to try and um, get ourselves ready for what will be, hopefully very soon, even more tr treatment trials uh, that are underway. And so this is just a picture that when we just had the ability to look in or the ability to take a colour photo, it would take us several years to, this is the same patient who started with early disease on the left and about three years later they had a little patch of the geographic atrophy on the right. You probably can't see it but there's a little patch here that uh, is now atrophic. So with the help of all the images we can actually predict much earlier who will run into trouble and this is some work that has really taken off uh, internationally where we've followed someone with a drusen uh, every three months or so over a long time. This is the topic of um, Z's, uh, Wu's um, uh, PhD, was to see which drusen were the ones that were going to go to atrophy. And if you can predict which ones are going to do that, then they're the ones that you would put, want to put in a study. And this happens long before you can see it. And so we need to teach optometry uh, how, and even our own colleagues how, how you read those OCT scans. And then just finally, what we're trying to do is we understand that for wet AMD in particular, the sooner you get in and treat it, the, the better the outcome. The better the vision when you walk in the door, the better the vision when you, when you leave. And so at the moment, in this 21st century, we still have a piece of paper with lines on it that we ask you to put on the fridge. You would think if we can send men to Mars, we could do a bit better than this. And so what we've been trying to do is use... Uh, app or an iPad and get a device that uh, has a test on it 
that not only is better at picking up early change, but also is remotely mon monitored back at the university. So if you use this to look for um, a loss of uh, sensitivity at seeing a light, there's a little guy back in the booth uh, back uh, at Melbourne Uni that's actually looking at those results. And, and if, if we get this uh, happening in a big way, could then generate an email to Mrs Smith to say, Mrs Smith, you didn't do a very good job on your test today. Perhaps you should go and see your ophthalmologist. Or even better, the email would also go to the ophthalmologist to say, Mrs Smith actually has dropped so many points on her, her um, app. Uh, did you think you should give her a ring or send her an appointment? And uh, eventually, we, rather than have this quite boring test, we would like to make a game like the kids have that will pick up uh, a, a subtle change in vision, vision. So not only will it be monitored and uh, be better uh, able to detect change earlier than this, but it actually will be enjoyable, it'll be competitive, it'll be interactive, it'll be addictive so that you'll want to do it um, and all day, every day. And that way we will pick up the, the earliest change because in fact in wet AMD, we don't need actually new drugs nearly as much as we need to get people to come in earlier than they are. So I think that finishes our um, discussion and we're open for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Is that a supplement? Is that a yeah. yeah? So I imagine it falls into the wide range of supplements for AMD. So um, I'm not sure exactly what is in it, but there are, are certainly trials which do suggest that perhaps taking um, some forms of supplements may help some forms of macular degeneration. You have to be quite careful as to which bit of the macular degeneration you have because they've only been found to be potentially suitable for some parts and not others. So for example, if one were to have the atrophic form, then there is a body of thought that in fact, perhaps one shouldn't be taking them. So I think if anyone has heard me talk before, I would much prefer people to eat a healthy diet, uh, fish and colored vegetables, than uh, necessarily taking a lot of the supplements and the supplements fall into two groups. One's are high levels of vitamins and zincs and the others are um, pigments. So lutein and zeaxanthin and I think they're quite different um, and I have no, uh, there's certainly no problem with taking lutein and zeaxanthin supplements but you can also get all that in uh, the dark green leafy vegetables uh, and corn uh, and eggs. So my problem is that uh, often we find that recommendations we give you about what to eat are often wrong down the track uh, and so I would rather just keep the healthy diet and um, unless there's some reason why you can't eat. Uh, well, then I um, don't tend to recommend supplements myself, recognising that others do. Yep. Boxing the second one. You know, everything gets scribbly. Mm -hmm. I've got that problem. What will I do now? So the question is, what if the Amsler grid is uh, distorted? So the first question would be, has it always been like that? So people will have some distortion on their Amsler grid even with some drusen. So the real question is, is there been a sudden change? So the idea is you're supposed to do the grid about once a week when you've first been told you've got the early stage of the disease and you test one eye and test the other and you know you get used to what it looks like and if you've been and had a, uh, an, a review and everyone's happy that you've got just drusen or a little bit of the atrophy, then whatever you've got is fine and it's a sudden, profound, obvious change from that should prompt uh, a, an urgent phone call to your eye care professional who then should have a look at you. So anyone that has a normal Amsler grid and then one day they have a look and it's all kinky or distorted or blurred should prompt you to have a look about it. So the question would be, is this been there for forever or is it something that happened this week? So if someone rings me, that's the first question I would ask. I should them. call back to my, to to my optometrist. If it's a new change, then that's what you okay, should do. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Yep. Um, at what age should children of parents with macular degeneration have their first checkup? 
So the question is, uh, when should children have a checkup? So we know that AMD is very much an inherited disease. Um, and by definition, it is not defined till after you're 50, although I certainly have a whole lot of people that have drusen long before 50. So what I tell people to do is when they first go for their reading glasses, if they know they have a family history of AMD, they should ask their optometrist, can they check for macular their macular health. So norm these days, a lot of optometrists have all these whiz-bang scans. So I'm more than happy for them to tell you if it's totally normal. If it's not normal, then it should, I think, also generate a, an appointment with an ophthalmologist. So the first step would be just to ask when they, when they go for reading glasses, which is around 50, um, can you tell me if my macula looks normal or abnormal? If it's abnormal, then I think they should have a, an opinion. Before that, at the moment, um, there's not a lot that you can do other than to recommend don't smoke and eat a healthy diet, keep a normal weight. Um, and if it were me, I'd be checking one eye at a time. But until there is a treatment like, for instance, the laser, there's not a lot of need to know that you've got a few drusen. However, if ours or another study showed that uh, you could slow down the progression, then it may well be everyone with a quite a strong family history should at least go along. Katerina talked about um, spectra, chroma and fibi. Can you just tell me a bit more about that? So they're the names of the studies that are currently being undertaken around the world for which we are recruiting for. And they're the studies for the dry macular degeneration. So they are just one company's uh, names that they have named one of the studies. Um, but essentially there are three currently recruiting studies for the dry form, which is terrific. There's never been studies for geographic atrophy until these ones, except for one other one. Um, and so that's great that now three totally different companies have got drugs that they want to try. And so it's really the beginning now of what we saw for wet that they'll all come tumbling out now that we have things that we can measure. through generation. Um, is there any research being done in trying to... Sure. Trying so the question is, what if you've lost all your vision, the central vision, what's, what's happening? So I guess that's where the stem cells start a little bit. Not that the stem cells are aiming to get vision back, but to try and stop more from progressing. Uh, and then the only thing currently that's called restorative research is in, the, say, the bionic eye. So we also take part in an Australian bionic eye development. So to bring back vision that's lost, that is difficult. And as you know, in macular degeneration, you don't lose all your vision. So you have to be very careful in whatever that you decide to do. You don't put at risk the peripheral vision. So currently, the uh, bionic eyes that are available to buy around the world are quite invasive and quite risky and should not be done in AMD, even though there have been one or two people who have had them. Whereas if you've got a low-risk device that could bring back central vision without risking peripheral vision, that might be another story. And that's certainly one that we're working on. But at the moment, no bionic device can give you the level of vision that you currently have, even though you've lost central vision from AMD. Remembering that you still see to walk around, the peripheral vision is actually quite good, so that you don't want to have a device that actually is worse than that, which is the current state of play. It will get better, but uh, isn't there yet. And stem cells at the moment are just replacing the nourishing layer to try and keep the cells that are destined to die alive so they don't replace the ones that have already been lost. So that's... Uh, I was just wondering about the uh, test that you said on, you could get on your iPad. Is that available now? Or? No. No. Um, except uh, if you're a part of our research. So what? So in the clinic, if you come uh, and have one eye injected, we're testing the other eye because we know that other eye is at risk. And uh, Byraby and Liz in the lead study are giving it to people that we currently see each six months to test it out. What I'm trying to do is raise some money to make a much more interesting game, in which case we will then try and do it more widely. But no, but ultimately we would offer it as a free app that you would download from the store and you would get it on your, your iPad. Um, and then potentially there would be, this is the model that's being used in America at the moment, but with a device that you have to buy at home is you pay a subscription to have it monitored. 
So you can have it yourself and monitor it, but if you want it to go back to a reading center or to your ophthalmologist, so in America, you can pay, and in fact, um, health funds will actually pay for you to have that monitored. So if we can get a good, a good device that works, which we have to test first to make sure we are going to pick up things, then that's my hope, is that everybody can just download it and use it. Okay, we'll have uh, one more, and then I think we might be done for the day. Thank you. Um, further to that, is there already an app for just a, an AMSLA grid? Absolutely, yeah. In fact, and if you, there is an app for an AMSLA grid, uh, and it will say, do you want to be monitored? Where is my closest monitor? And when I did that, it was in like Seattle somewhere. So it's uh, the app that I downloaded was clearly meant for the uh, American market. But yes, you can get the, the AMSLA grid on an iPad. Uh, and so in our test, we have that one plus our new one uh, to see if we can compare the two to see which one picks up change earlier. Good. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming once again. Please fill in the, um, the form that says how wonderful we were. Uh, we could pre-fill them in for you and put excellent. In fact, that's a good idea for next year. We'll do that. Um, So the um, sure, sure. Is there a postal address on the? Yep, yep. You can take it home and write nice things and send it back. So thank you once again for coming and let us know if we can answer anything more on the way out. Thank you.